Energy Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi, and I'm pleased to serve as the host for the seminar series this fall. We're operating today in a hybrid format. Uh, so thanks to everyone joining us online, and thanks for everyone here in the room. We're thrilled to have with us today Nicholas Stevens for his talk, Pricing Rules for Electricity Auctions with Non-Convexities. Nicholas is a researcher for the Center for Operations Research and Econometrics at UC Levant in Belgium. He's currently a visiting researcher at the Harvard Kennedy School. His PhD dissertation, Price Formation with Non-Convexities, Theory and Applications for the Electricity Market, examines how the pricing rules in electricity auctions may accommodate the non-convexities non that are present in the market orders. He previously worked as a consultant on the design of the European Day Ahead Market in collaboration with the European Power Exchanges. Nicholas, welcome to the Energy Policy Seminar. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Joe, for the kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to speak here. Um, so I'm very happy to spend this semester at the Kennedy School and to get a chance today to uh, present this work uh, in front of you. Um, now, I kind of realized last week when I was doing the slide that the title that I chose was maybe a little bit frightening, uh, but I'm happy to see that many faces uh, in the room. Um, now, before I start, let me just say that so this talk is um, mostly based on one paper that has been recently accepted in energy economics, and it's a joint work with uh, Yves Smears from uh, UC Louvain, Belgium, and Anthony Papavasilio from the National Technical University of Athens. Now, there are uh, primarily two motivations for uh, the issue that we are studying here. Uh, one motivation is a little bit more uh, theoretical, let's say, and another motivation is really related to some uh, ongoing discussion that there has been uh, between policymakers on the electricity markets in the US and also in Europe. Uh, and so I would like to just speak, take a bit of time to speak about both motivations. Let me start with uh, the theoretical motivation first. I think the best way to just understand what this is all about is to look together at a small example. So please consider this small market that I have drawn on this slide. Um, so in this market, there is a demand curve that is made of two bids, A and B, uh, and there is a supply curve made of two bids, C and D. Now you can really view that as a small representation of an electricity market, or you can also view that as uh, an auction where that would be the different bids that are submitted by suppliers and consumers. And then the auctioneer needs to find what would be the cleared allocation and also to announce a market clearing price. Right? So if everyone, everything here was uh, convex, I assume that a lot of you see that the allocation that would maximize the surplus of this small market would be to clear A entirely, to clear 90 megawatts on the supply offer number C, and then to reject the other bids, right? So with this allocation, the surplus would be this area between A and C. Uh, and then if you pick a price of 30 euros per megawatt hour, uh, well, with that price, all the market participants, they would have the right incentive to implement the allocation that I've just described, right? Now, the issue uh, that we are going to study is what happens if I add just a tiny constraint on that market, and I say that now the offer number C here is indivisible, right? So it can produce either zero or it can produce 100, but it cannot produce anything in between. Then you can ask again, okay, what would be the optimal allocation and what would be the market clearing price? So the optimal allocation is quite straightforward. Uh, you would now clear C entirely because it's indivisible. You would clear A, but now you would also clear 10 megawatts on the demand bid number B, right? So uh, the surplus would be the area in light gray here between A and C, minus the area in dark gray between C and B. So as far as the surplus of the market is concerned, adding this small constraint does not change much, right? There is a small change, but there is uh, not a dramatic change. What dramatically changes, however, is that in this case, you cannot find one price anymore that would make everyone happy or anyone, everyone willing to implement uh, this allocation, right? That's the fundamental change with what we have seen before. Uh, I think it's quite straightforward to see here. So if you take a price, for example, of 20 euros, uh, 
Well, for this part of 20 euros, A and B would be willing to consume what you want them to consume, but C would not like to produce anything because he's losing 10 euros for each megawatt hour that he would produce, right? Now, if you take a price then of 30 euros, well, C would be happy, but now it's B that would not be willing to consume anything because his willingness to pay is only of 20 euros. And you can turn it around, there is, you know, any price you would take, you would end up with a situation like that what, where not everyone would like to actually implement the allocation that maximizes the surplus. Another way to view it is if you simply draw supply and demand correspondences, uh, well, you would you observe then in this supply correspondence that you have this discontinuity, this, this leap, uh, which is due to the indivisibility of C. Uh, and that results in having a supply and demand curve that uh, simply do not cross, right? And so there is no equilibrium. Right. So this is the issue that we are going to look at. And what we are going to see in the next 45 minutes is whether or not there are ways to solve that or to mitigate the issue that I've just described. I think theoretically it also kind of connects to some fundamental question about what a market and a price can do in a situation that deviates a little bit from the classic assumption that you see in microeconomics. Uh, for example, there is this economist, Albert Scar, that works on that topic in the 90s and made the statement that in the presence of, his indiv of indivisibilities in production, the price is simply down to the job that uh, they are meant to do. So that is for the theoretical motivation of the issue we're going to, to study together. Uh, now, this topic turns out to be not only a theoretically interesting or intriguing uh, question, but also an issue that actually uh, has arisen in the last 20 years uh, in policy discussion about the electricity markets. Um, and so there has been a lot of discussion uh, in the implementation of uh, American uh, electricity market, but also in Europe. And so I would like to spend a little bit of time now to just explain you this, uh, this policy context. So as I guess a lot of you know, um, electricity is kind of very peculiar uh, commodity, right? So some of the main attributes of electricity uh, include the fact that it's exchanged to, through an electrical grid. Uh, so that means that to exchange electricity between different locations, it has to go through an electrical network that comes with stringent uh, physical constraints, uh, which govern how electricity may flow on such a power grid. Another attribute is that your demand of electricity must be met just in time by production at each and every location of the grid and at each and every second, right? We are right now consuming electricity that should be met by some suppliers at each and every moment. If there would be some persistent difference uh, between the supply and demand of electricity, if that difference would be significant and, and be persistent for several seconds, in the worst case, that may lead to some outages and then cascading outages, and in the worst case, a complete failure of the system. So uh, power systems are a sensitive machine, right? Uh, to make things even more complicated, uh, electricity turns out to be, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of hard or expensive to store, right? It does not store well. And uh, the demand of electricity turns out to be also uh, very inelastic, especially when you come close to real time. Economically, that's just due to the fact that there are few substitutes to electricity uh, and also typically due to the lack uh, of problems of metering. So I'm not sure here, for example, in Cambridge where you stand, but uh, in my house in Brussels, for example, I just have one meter, which is able to tell how much I've consumed last year. Uh, but nothing more specific than that, which means like in real time, the price will soar up. I could not even be exposed to it. So I would be virtually completely inelastic. Right. So the bottom line is that all these attributes of electricity systems, they drive the need of a lot of coordination, right? You need a lot of coordination between the suppliers, transmission operator, and so on. If you want the, uh, the power system to work efficiently. Now, uh, this coordination, it used to be provided before the regulation of power system by one single firm. Right? There was one vertically integrated monopoly that was just optimizing the entire supply chain of electricity from uh, production of electricity to tra uh, transport, distribution to retail. That was just one firm providing this coordination by optimizing everything altogether. Uh, and the idea to deregulate the electricity markets uh, in the end, it's kind of an idea to take this coordination from the hand of one single firm and to put it in the market. So now the market has to provide with this coordination 
uh, between a different agent that the attributes that I've described are, are calling for. So the question, how can we design electricity markets in such a way that they can provide us with this uh, coordination? Now we will uh, see in a minute how they have been implemented in different regions in the US and in Europe. Uh, and you will see that electricity markets are very heterogeneous in the way they have exactly been implemented in different regions of the world. However, they also, all these electricity markets, they also share some common characteristics that are important. And as far as the subject matter of this talk is concerned, I think there are three main characteristics that are shared by all these electricity markets around the globe, which are important to keep in mind. So the first uh, characteristics is that electricity markets are very centralized uh, market. So they are typically organized as closed gate uniform price auctions. Uh, so that is really what we have seen on the first slide, right? You would have one auctioneer that received supply and demand bids, the gate closes, the auctioneer runs some algorithm to clear the market. He announced the dispatch that he provides to all suppliers and consumers, and he computes a price. That's really the way most electricity market that we are concerned with in this talk uh, work. So very centralized market. Uh, second point, they are also market that typically integrates uh, multiple commodities in one single market session. So it's in one market, you typically clear electrical energy, of course, at different locations of the grid. These markets also uh, often include the auctioning of the transmission, right? So the ability to uh, exchange electricity between the different locations. Right, so this transmission capacity is part of what is auctioned in one in the same market. And they also often include some additional ancillary services, but I, I won't really talk about that. And these markets are also often run on um, for 24 hours. Right, so these are multi-periods markets, which so often it's 24 hours, so like 24 periods of one hour or 96 periods of 15 minutes. So they are multi-periods markets. So the idea is that the, this market that we are studying, and in particular the pricing problem that we will look at, you should view that as a multi-dimensional problem, where in one single market session, you compute hundreds or thousands of price at the same time. Uh, now, in, uh, third important characteristic is uh, the way in which the suppliers may express the information within the market is typically not only with a uh, very simple price quantity bids, uh, but they have actually the way to express the cost structure and the operational constraints in a much more detailed fashion within these markets. Um, so they do not only submit like yeah price quantity bids, but they can submit uh, the information about your, the cost structure, like what is the variable cost of production, what is the startup cost. Uh, they can submit explicitly some operational constraints, like if my power plant is started up, it needs to be online for X hours or these kind of things. Um, so these multi-part non-convex bits are used in all, uh, all the power markets uh, in the United States and also in Europe. I think the trade-off here is a little bit that by enabling the suppliers to provide more information directly in the market, the market is providing more coordination between these suppliers. At the same time, that is really like this third part here is really what creates the issue that we have just seen on the first slide. Well, the issue that this talk is about is, well, because you enable them to express this cost and operational constraints in a more detailed way in the market, well, you cannot find a price that clears the market. That, that's a bit the main drawback. Um, right, to make things a little bit more concrete, uh, so that would be the electricity market landscape in the United States in this figure. Um, so in white, these are the regions that are still uh, managed as vertically integrated monopolies subject to some cost of service uh, type of regulation. And then the colored region corresponds to the places where a market is implemented. Uh, now in these regions, uh, you have an independent system, the so-called independent system operator or ISO that operates the grid and organize the market. Now these markets, they are again heterogeneous in the way they are implemented, but they all share the characteristics I have described on the previous slide, right? So the market organized by Kaizo in California is a bit different than the market organized by Elcott in Texas and so on. Uh, but these, all these markets, the one by PGM, ISO New England and so on, they all share this characteristic that I've seen, uh, that we have seen together on the last slide. And in particular, they all have the third bullet point of my last slide, 
meaning they are facing the problem we've seen on the first uh, on the very first slide. Now, the way in which this all, all these different ISO uh, have uh, managed or are trying to manage this problem that we have seen uh, in the first slide is also heterogeneous between uh, these different regions. And I'm trying to uh, summarize some of the main milestones here on the timeline. So I, I think it's fair to say that in, in the early 2000s, uh, marginal pricing was typically adopted by the ISO to clear the market. So this is classic marginal pricing that you know in economics, which works well in convex settings. That's just applied to these non-convex auctions. Now, because some of the uh, agents in the market would be unhappy with the price, uh, what the ISO uh, does is that they include some side payments. So they would compensate all this deviation of incentive that the different market participants may have by providing them with additional discriminatory payments. Now, what experience revealed is that uh, this payment can actually turn out to be uh, significant, and, and that kind of uh, impair the damage the transparency of, of your market. And so very quickly emerged the idea that maybe there could be some uh, more interesting way to solve this issue than just applying marginal pricing and, 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 uh, and do these side payments. Maybe there, there would be a more uh, clever solution to that issue. And that's what, what we're going to see uh, together. Now, in particular, if you look like at the last uh, 10 years, uh, this issue uh, has still be, been discussed a lot during the last 10 years. And in particular, so in 2014, uh, there is the regulator, the FERC, that uh, launched a consultation about price formation in the electricity markets. And that's cons uh, that, that consultation was followed by some proposals of reform by some ISO, such as uh, MISO or uh, PGM. So three things to remember from this slide. So all these markets that I've colored here, they face the problem that we have seen on the first slides. The way they are addressing this problem is heterogeneous between uh, these different regions. And there are still ongoing discussion on how we should, in the end, tackle this problem. <clears throat> Let's look at Europe now. Uh, so the way in which electricity market works in Europe is kind of uh, similar than in the US, but also a little bit different. Uh, the deregulation itself also occurred in the late 90s, or early 2000. Uh, so in 1993, you have European single markets. 1996 is the first, uh, uh, the so-called first energy package or a package of European laws that kind of kicked off the liberalization of the power sector. Uh, and that was followed in 2003 and, and nine by the so-called second and third energy packages, which all together effectively led to the deregulation uh, of the power sector in Europe. Now the institutional way that this market organized is a little bit different than in United States. So in the US, we've seen that there are there is one independent system operator that runs that operates the grids and uh, runs the markets on a particular geographical region. In Europe, it's a bit different. You have typically one national so-called TSO, so transmis transmission system operator that operates the grid. So this is, for example, RT in France or Red Electrica in Spain, and so on. And then you have the so-called nominated electricity market operators or the power exchanges, uh, which are in charge of organizing the market itself. And that is a pan-European market that is not at the national level, but that spans over uh, entire Europe. So the countries that I have colored in blue uh, here. And to give you maybe some hints about the, the history of this market. Uh, so one date uh, to remember is 2006. That was the trilateral market coupling. Uh, which was a market between France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Um, and then this market was extended to Germany in 2010 to cover the entire uh, Central Western European region. Uh, and then that market was uh, merged with a market that already existed in the Nordics and also extended to some Mediterranean countries in 2014 under the name Price Coupling of Region. And that is still the market that exists today and that kept extending during the last uh, decade such that today it covers all these countries colored in blue. So in total, there are 27 countries, 30 TSOs, uh, 16 NEMOs, and I don't know how many languages. Uh, but so that's the pan-European market as it, as it looks like uh, today. Now, as far as the problem that we are concerned with in this talk is concerned, uh, so this market also includes this non-convex multipart bid that we have seen. It also faced the same problem as the one we 
see in the US as the one I've explained on the first slide. Uh, and the way it solves it uh, is uh, actually very different than the way it was done in the United States. So the pricing rule that they've implemented is something completely different. It's actually something inherited from this trilateral market coupling from 2006. Um, and I want, I, I don't really have the time to enter into the details of how it works, although I'm happy to take questions on that at the end if, if there are some. Uh, but the idea is that they have, there are some, uh, like experiences reveal that there are some drawbacks with the way they are managing these non-convex bids in the market. And these drawbacks include the fact that the allocation that is cleared in the market may be inefficient. So there might be inefficiencies in uh, the way the allocation is, is, um, is cleared by the market. There, it also entails some price discrimination uh, between the different uh, market agents. And finally, uh, there are also, I mean, this kind of auction should be viewed as very complicated mathematical problem. And so they have encountered some uh, uh, scalability issue, some computational issue with this pricing rule, uh, which, have, which has also urged them to kind of think about how they could reform uh, this rule. And so that was a bit the starting point of this research. So obviously our research is very motivated by just a the theoretical problem that I've described on the first slide, uh, but it was more particularly motivated also by these ongoing discussions in Europe to how we can reform uh, the pricing rule in the auctions. So in particular, there has been some research that uh, um, was undertaken by the different uh, power exchanges in the last few years. So I'm quoting here some references. Uh, and they basically picked an interest on some of the approach that have been used by the ISOs uh, in the United States. Right? And so we kind of thought, okay, that's maybe a good moment then to just revisit a little bit this debate. Uh, as a matter of fact, it has not really been solved in the US neither, so there are still ongoing discussion about that in the United States. So we thought, okay, it's maybe a good moment to just revisit the debate, trying to list and establish what could be the possible solutions to the problem we have seen before, what are the uh, advantages and drawbacks of each of these uh, solutions, and you know, just make a, a comparison of all of these things. Now, the way we proceed uh, in the paper is actually uh, as follows. So we just propose a model of this, uh, so a mathematical model of this problem. Uh, we kind of formalize different possible solutions to it. And then we establish a number of mathematical properties that you can uh, derive for these particular solutions. And finally, we illustrate our findings and our properties with some simulation done with auction data sets. Now, the way I propose to proceed for this talk is a bit different. Uh, so we will, now that we have seen the motivation, we'll go to the theoretical framework. So I will just try to uh, explain you how I, I think we should uh, think to the pro uh, think about the problem that we have seen on the first slide. Uh, what are the possible solutions to it? Uh, and then we skip the more theoretical part of the paper where I develop some properties, uh, mathematical properties and so on. I will just skip that part and go directly to uh, the numerical simulation to see how the different solution that we would have seen together directly to see how they behave on real auction data sets. Right? So that's the agenda for the next 25 minutes, something like this, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think the best way to try to understand how we can think about this issue, uh, all during the paper we do that more, let's say mathematically, I think in the end, by looking at a simple example, we can just have an idea of all the important concepts that we should keep in mind when we think about this issue. Mm -hmm. So on the first slide, uh, we saw that there were no equilibrium. What we want to do now is try to characterize a little bit more precisely what exactly is going on and what kind of issue we are facing a bit more precisely. Because even if there is no equilibrium, it might be that some pricing solution could be better than other prices solution, even if they are not exactly in equilibrium. Um, so the one, what we want to do is to characterize more precisely how far we stand from an equilibrium and try to put a number of how inconsistent are the price and the allocation uh, that we have. So in order to do that, let's look together at this small example. So it's just a slightly more elaborated version of the example of the first slide, where we still have uh, two demand bids, and then we have three supply bids instead of two, uh, C, D, and E. And C and D are indivisible. So they are all or nothing offered. With these uh, settings, the allocation that maximizes the surplus 
And by the way, I promise this is the last example of the slide. So uh, the allocation that would maximize the total surplus would be uh, the following. So instead, uh, all you see is cheaper than D. Uh, you don't want to clear it because since it's indivisible, if you clear it, you should clear 200 megawatt of it. And so considering that, the cheapest solution is um, to, to select the bid number D instead of C. Right. Now with this allocation, I think there are Three, I mean, when you just look at this example, there are really three main prices that you would like to investigate a little bit further. Uh, so one price is uh, 15 euro over here. So if you select 15 euros, it's not an equilibrium. More precisely, what happens is, well, for 15 euro, your bid number D here uh, is very unhappy because he's losing money, right? He's losing 10 euro for each megawatt hour he produces. So he has a revenue shortfall, which is in total of 1,000 euro, okay? Now, the other thing that happens is that B is also unhappy, uh, but for a slightly different reason. So B is not losing money, uh, but the thing is that B has a willingness to pay off 20 euros, right? Uh, so for a price of 15 euro, it would actually like to consume uh, it, uh, its entire bid, right? So it would like to consume more than just 10 megawatt hour. So if you ask him to consume 10 with a price of 15 euros, uh, B is frustrated because he has a foregone, he's foregoing an opportunity. Right? So B has a last opportunity of 50 euros. And then you can just go on with this analysis and then look at what happened if you take a price of 20 euros now. With 20 euro, B is still losing money, but a little less. B is now uh, fine. And what happened is that C now is unhappy because although he's not losing money, he's also foregoing now an opportunity. Because for this price, it would earn, it would make profit, so it would like to produce two hundred. Uh, so now, C as a last opportunity of one thousand, and then finally, if you take a price of twenty five euros, then D finally breaks even. Uh, C has even a bigger last opportunity now, and uh, it's B now that is also losing money because his willingness to pay below is below the price. Okay. So when we kind of think through an example like that. I think the two concepts that kind of very quickly arises are uh, the following. You have the idea of lost opportunity cost, which measure uh, how the price is incentive compatible, like how far we stand from the equilibrium itself. Mathematically, if you want to define it, it's the lost opportunity cost would be defined as the difference between the maximum profit that a supplier or uh, a demand bid or like a market agent could make given the price, minus the profit that it does make if he implements the allocation cleared in the auction, right? So that is the concept of lost opportunity cost, uh, the difference between the maximum profit if you sell schedule minus, uh, and uh, so the difference between this profit and the profit that he makes uh, in the auction. Um, so another way to view it, it's that's really what measures whether the price supports the solution, right? So if, if the lost opportunity cost is big, it means they have incentive to self-schedule. And if all these market participants self-schedule, the dispatch that is cleared in the auction may simply unravel, right? So that is the first, I think, concept that have emerged in our previous example. Uh, the second concept is the one of revenue shortfall. So that is just, well, given the price, uh, do, do we have revenue adequacy? Like the different market participants, do they simply break even with that price, yes or no? Um, one way I think uh, we should view this revenue shortfall is that if you want this is a particular type of lost opportunity, right? It's a particular type where the lost opportunity is, I would like to self-schedule at zero, right? The guys that are losing money in the auction, what they would simply like to do is to exit the market, okay? So these are the two concepts that uh, I think emerge when we just analyze an example like, like the previous one. It is also, as a matter of fact, the two examples, the two uh, uh, concept that have been used a lot in scientific literature in the past 20 years to think about this uh, issue. Uh, and so that's the main two things that we are going to monitor uh, in our numerical analysis later on. Okay, then what would be uh, the possible solution to our uh, issue here? I think there are three main options that I was considering. One option is just marginal pricing, right? This is uh, a very important concept in economics. You can simply use marginal pricing uh, as in the rest of economics and apply it to this non-convex auction. In the particular example we have seen, marginal pricing in this case would be 20 euros. 
that's maybe not that straightforward to see, but I think the intuition is simply that when you have these indivisibilities, if you look at the allocation where you fix these indivisibilities, uh, B would be the guy that is at the margin, right? So it would be setting the price at 20 euros. So marginal pricing, that's first option that you may want to consider. Second possible solution, well, let's just take the price. We have seen lost opportunity cost, uh, the concept of lost opportunity cost. Let's just pick the price that minimizes that. Right? So that is the price that would be as incentive compatible as possible. If you look at the different numbers you see here, uh, indeed with 15 euros, the total lost opportunity cost is 1,050 euros, which is smaller than 1,500 or 2,050. Right? So this is the price that is as incentive compatible as possible that uh, is as close as possible to an equilibrium. And then third option, and yeah, by the way, so this, um, in the literature, this has been called convex pricing for some mathematical reason, uh, but you should not be frightened. That's just the price that minimizes lost opportunity cost, okay? And then third option, well, instead of minimizing the lost opportunity cost, can we simply not minimize revenue shortfall instead? So let's take a price that, as much as possible, is such that everyone breaks even, right? Uh, and in this case, that price would be 25 euros because the revenue shortfall in that case is 50 euros, while it was 500 with the other price here and 1,000 with the price of 15. Right. So to summarize, we have uh, three main candidates that we want to investigate. Of course, you could think about an infinite number of other candidates, but what I would argue is that I think these are really the three kind of cardinal points that you want to keep in mind when you are thinking about this issue, right? So there is, on the one hand, uh, I mean, first, there is marginal pricing. There is the price that minimizes lost opportunity costs, that is as incentive compatible as possible. And there is, third, the price that minimizes revenue shortfall, or that try as much as possible that all the market participant breaks even with the uniform price alone. Right. Uh, maybe a, a quick comment is just that, so one comment that there has often been about the second option, so the price that is as incentive compatible as possible, <clears throat> uh, is that you know mathematically these are all very complicated problems, and this one turns out to be actually difficult uh, to solve. So the, the two other uh, mathematical problems associated with the other pricing methods are actually pretty straightforward to solve uh, mathematically, like algorithmically speaking, it's very straightforward to compute. While the second one, uh, it, it's kind of tough. Uh, the good news is, um, so actually in my PhD, the first work that I did was just to develop algorithm to try to solve this thing. Uh, and so the good news is that now uh, with this algorithm, you can actually solve big auction data sets uh, within only a few minutes. I mean, all the, the results that you, will, that you will see, that's kind of thing that are solved in a few minutes on a personal computer. Um, that's also maybe one reason why also in the past two decades, there has not been a lot of exercise like the one I'm doing here. We just try to compare these different approaches simply because, for example, this approach, it was not possible to compute it, right? So that was maybe one motivation also for the work here to now that we have this, uh, that we can compute this thing, let's try to analyze a bit further. Okay. Um, I propose we have a look now in like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes on uh, to uh, the numerical results. So as I said, in the paper, you will see it's a bit more uh, uh, heavy mathematically. So I rather do a mathematical comparison of all these approaches. And then I illustrate the finding with these numerical simulations. Here, I thought it was a bit more entertaining like this. I just do the other way around. So I will just show you the numerical results and I might uh, uh, hint you when, when it's possible to actually formalize something mathematically uh, when we go through these results. Right, so in order to do that, we have used two different data sets. Um, so the first uh, uh, auction data set is the so-called FERC data set. Uh, it includes around 1,000 uh, power units. We have 11 different load scenarios, uh, but the main limitation of this data set is that there is no network, right? Um, so that is a kind of a limit because the network is a really important part of an electricity auction. And that's the reason why we are also using another data set which is later called CWE dataset. Uh, so it has 70 power units, but it includes a network of 30 bidding zones. <clears throat> and we have also 12 uh, load scenarios. Okay. Now, uh, the way we have done that is 
we have our two auction data sets. For each of these data sets, we implement something that simply clears the market that computes what is the optimal allocation. And then we have implemented the three pricing candidates that we have seen. And actually, we have implemented a little more than that. Uh, and then for each candidate, we just simulate and compute what would be the price if we choose this approach. And finally, we can measure what are the resulting loss opportunity cost and revenue shortfall for each of these approach, right? So each column here corresponds to one pricing scheme. And then you see here the loss opportunity cost and revenue shortfall, right? Uh, so in the paper, we discussed uh, several different things. Here, I propose to focus on five main messages. So the first thing is, if you look at marginal pricing, uh, at least relatively to some other alternatives that we have in the table, uh, the lost opportunity cost and revenue shortfall that we end up with are relatively high. Uh, I think this is coherent also with the experience that has been in the United States by the uh, ISOs. And the intuition is, if you know, if you want marginal pricing, simply ignores all the fixed cost components of your cost structure, right? It ignores startup costs, all the lumpy costs that you have are ignored, and therefore not reflected in the price signal. And that in the end damages the incentive that the different uh, market participants are facing. I think that, that's a little bit the intuition. So compared to that, if you implement convex pricing that minimize LOC, you indeed improve significantly, like you get by 10 the lost opportunity cost that you had with marginal pricing. And what is interesting is that it's not only on average like, or in total that you improve the incentives of the market participant, but also individually. So if you look at each individual supplier, uh, what I've drawn here on the, on the box plot is the, what each individual supplier bears uh, uh, bear as a revenue, as a, sorry, as a lost opportunity cost. And you see that with marginal pricing, you have several instances where one single market participant could have $10,000 uh, or more of incentive to schedule differently than the market uh, ask him to schedule, right? And this distribution is really um, um, squeezed towards zero if you implement uh, convex pricing, right? So basically, you improve total lost opportunity cost, so total incentive, but also how the incentive are distributed between market participants. Um, okay, that is same kind of story if you look at the other data sets where um, lost opportunity costs are improved significantly. And then uh, another question that we wanted to ask in this uh, research is what happens if the market size increases? So if, if the number of suppliers or market participants increase a lot, should we expect this non-convexity and this problem to just disappear, like to smoothen out so that, such that when the market is big, everything smoothen out and, 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 uh, um, and uh, we don't face any more the problem that we have seen? Yes or no? And remarkably, you can actually answer that question in a very specific way. Like mathematically, you can establish some very precise thing. And the question, and, and the answer is, uh, yes, it may smoothen out, but that depends on which price you actually choose. So the experiment we have uh, done and that I illustrate here on the slides uh, is the following. So let's select 50 power units out of one of our data sets, right? We scale the load accordingly, and then we duplicate that in order to increase the market size, right? So here we artificially create a small market and then we increase this market uh, from 50 power units to 1,000 power units, and we of course scale the load accordingly. Then we, for each of these cases, we compute the optimal solution, we compute the prices, and we monitor the lost opportunity cost. And the big difference, and what you can actually establish uh, rigorously, is that if you choose convexive pricing here, what happens is that indeed it's smoothen out. So you can guarantee that these lost opportunity costs are bonded, and so the relative magnitude uh, goes to zero as the market size increases. Uh, while the, the, the same thing does not hold for other pricing approach, in particular for marginal pricing, where you see that here, whatever the market size, the relative importance of this LOC remains the same um, for all the different market sizes. Right? Um, so with this second approach that try to be as incentive compatible as possible, it improves the incentive of the market participant, the distribution of it, and also it guarantees that this remain bonded and goes to zero when the market size grows, right? Uh, now, the other thing that we observe is that interestingly, if you look now at the revenue shortfall, 
this approach turns out to also be quite su successful on that front. Uh, so you see that the revenue shortfall are significantly lower than with marginal pricing when you implement that. I think the intuition here is a bit what I've explained uh, before, that the revenue shortfall should be viewed as one very specific type of lost opportunity. And so when you minimize the LOC, it's not the same thing as when you minimize revenue shortfall. But when you minimize the LOC, you cannot guarantee that this revenue shortfall would remain contained because they are part of the total incentive that you are trying to improve, right? And what is very uh, what, what was interesting to us is that if this is true in that case, the reverse is not true, right? So, and that's what we're going to see in the next slide. So when you try to minimize revenue shortfall, so when you try to have a price that is as close as possible to break even for all the market participants, the incentive may explode completely. Like you may damage significantly the last opportunity cost, right? Uh, and that's my last message on this slide. Um, so the first thing is, so remember, so these are the approach that try to minimize what we have called the revenue shortfall. What you see here is that there are three different columns. <clears throat> so why is that? Um, that's first thing I want to say is that if you think about it, actually minimizing the revenue shortfall, so trying to have a price that is such that as far as possible market participant breaks even, is a very mild requirement. Like if you think about it, when you have if you have inelastic load, you just take a price that is very high and for sure everyone will break even, right? So that can be viewed as a very build requirement. And mathematically, that means that you have big indeterminacies. Right? And because you have this indeterminacy, you need to find some way to solve it. And the three columns correspond to three different ways that people have proposed in the literature to solve that uh, issue. And I will just now focus on the one that works uh, the best. So what you see in the result is indeed it improves the revenue shortfall. So they go from 19, and so this is uh, dollars or euro, dollars on this one. So it goes from 19 to zero. So you have a reduction, but which is very small. I mean, uh, but on the other hand, by reducing that, you increase substantially the lost opportunity cost, right? So when you try to have something that is, uh, that's as far as possible, try to minimize the revenue shortfall, you exacerbate a, loss, a lot the lost opportunity cost while the reverse we saw was not true. Uh, and actually, when you do look at the other data set, when you have a network, uh, this kind of uh, becomes completely crazy, where when you lower this revenue shortfall, the lost opportunity costs completely, uh, are completely out of control. So that is a bit the effect, this asymmetry between when you try to be as incentive compatible as possible, revenue shortfall remain low. When you try to minimize the revenue shortfall, lost opportunity costs explode. That's uh, what we observe here. Okay, and so that's it. So let me just try to conclude in one slide. So what we have seen is uh, the issue that arises when you have non-convexities or indivisibilities in your production processes in an auction, you have no equilibrium, right? So this is a problem that arises in all the electricity market that exists in the United States and also in Europe. And there has been a lot of policy discussion around that to how we can actually reform this rule and find good solution to it. Uh, so in particular, there has been some discussion in Europe in the past two, three years, trying to reform that. Uh, and as far as the European pricing rule is concerned, I would say that I think marginal pricing could be an upgrade compared to the current pricing rule because of the different drawback that it has. However, we have seen that this was not necessarily the best candidate that we have on the table. And also the fact that in the United States, the different markets have tended to move away from that uh, is maybe something that European stakeholders might want to pay attention to. Um, and then we have seen that one particular approach, uh, the one that is trying to be as incentive compatible as possible, has several uh, advantages. So it improves the incentive of market participants and also the distribution of it. Uh, it ensures that revenue shortfall remains uh, relatively small, and it even guarantees that when your market size grows, uh, everything will smoothen out and this incentive will overall improve. And finally, we saw that uh, the option of minimizing revenue shortfall, although it might sound like a reasonable idea when you look at small examples and things like that, uh, in practice, it may also result in very high, like unbearable uh, lost opportunity costs. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. We'll open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, as a reminder, a question is a sentence that ends with a question mark. 
I see a couple of hands uh, show, uh, go up here. Let me start here. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, very uh, nice presentation. I guess I have a technical question and then uh, more of a broader level question. If you go to slide number 30. Yep. I'm trying to understand this uh, scaling issue as you described. Yep. What, what, which, from where do I see that uh, the LOC will not scale versus the other one, but right. will scale? So this is the LOC and that's LOC divided by the total cost uh -huh. of the auction. And this cost, of course, increases with the market size. And this over here, you see it tends to zero, so it, it reduces. Mm -hmm. While with marginal pricing, it remains around 15% here. So it's percentage-wise, the convex hull pricing will drive down the percentage of the so LOC. So the, the, the uh, ratio of lost opportunity cost on market size, market size, for example, measured by the total cost of your market, this ratio goes to zero with convex pricing, while it does not with marginal pricing. Okay. And mathematically, what, what happens is, so it, actually, interestingly, so this result is connected to some important results in the, that were developed in the 60s, 70s in microeconomics, uh, and that you can just transpose to the setting that we have here. The idea is that actually you can prove that there is, with this approach, you have a bond on the LOC. And this bond does not depend on the number right. of suppliers. Right. Yeah. So when the number of suppliers increase, this bond remains the same. And so the relative importance of that goes to zero. Yeah. The That's follow up would, thank you. Um, the follow up is that I agree with you. The overall, you know, sort of a motivation comes from this non-convex part of the bidding, like the yeah. in, in, indivisibility of the generator number C. But one could also argue that this non-convexity manifests itself in many different types of realizations. Some of them could be this indivisible property as you described, but yeah. I would argue those are probably going kind of a little bit further away from the reality because we're gonna have a lot more smaller distributed energy resources. So that particular motivation may not be the most important one, but there will be many other contextuals of non-convexity such as, you know, ramping and, uh, yes. um, you know, other things like uh, uncertainty related. Uh, so I'm just sort of curious on your thoughts about how generalizable is your conclusion from these other kind of non-convexities? Okay, so as far as I, so, so maybe first to react to the first thing that you had said. So um, I agree with you that you could think that because the market has more renewables, for example, and these are typically, they do not include indivisibilities, you might think that this problem then just goes away. I think you could argue the opposite that because you have more renewable, uh, that means conventional power plant, they will typically operate in a much more cyclic way where they have to start up and shut down uh, more frequently because they need to accommodate for this new volatility. And because they need to start up and shut down more frequently, the fixed cost of the cost structure, like the startup cost, becomes more important. So I think there is at least one paper, but uh, I mean, I can find the name uh, after the talk, but that was just studying what happens in a market when you increase the number of renewables. And what happens is that the startup cost becomes the more important part of the total cost when you have more renewable because it's a most, uh, it's a cost that occurs more frequently because of this cycling operation of power plants. So to some extent, I, I think these problems can still happen even if you have more important renewables. Uh, but for the second part of the question, as far as I know, there has been some work on this non-convexity issue uh, mainly related to the network, like if we account for some non-convexity on that front. And that's something I've simply not done here. Uh, so it's true that here I limit a bit the investigation to non-convexities on the suppliers, and I don't necessarily have like that a big idea of what would happen if we consider other types of uh, indivisibilities. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, let me follow up real quick on that, and then we'll, we'll go here, which is... When I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this ramping problem and the sort of correlation across bidding periods yeah. of the indivisibilities. I mean, I think of like a nuclear power plant kind of wanted to flip the switch and be on, and it's 2 a.m. and maybe there's a lot of wind blowing, and yeah. it's C, right? It's producing more than what's actually being demanded. Yeah. Uh, and the challenge is you've got this sort of zero-cost power wanting to bid in if the wind is blowing at 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah. But you're, going, you're not going to ramp that thing down because by 7 a.m., demand is shifting out and it's no longer indivisible. Yes. Does this correlation, should should we think about that correlation in any of these pricing rules across periods? 
does it affect how we might think about the analysis or is it something that we can simplify and still do it on a period by period basis? Uh, no, no. Um, so, so I think that this um, correlation that exists between different periods that are due to some operational constraint like ramping or minimum uptime or these kind of things, which are indeed for some of them are non-convex type of constraints. Mm -hmm. I, I think they are very important. It should, so the, the this type of thing, they are all included in the simulation, like in the model we run here. For the toy example, it's just that it's more convenient to show that on a one hour example. But I agree with you that I, I think you should really think about that as like multi-period type of problem. And indeed, this non-convexity is also arise from the connection, like the correlation there is between different periods. Yeah, okay. with that. Thanks. Fascinating presentation, thank you. Um, it seems to me there's a political dimension to the choice of pricing model here. Yep. Because um, <clears throat> the uh, you showed a distribution of a lost opportunity cost and revenue shortfall. If those are high, those hammer big plants. Um, they hammer uh, large thermal plants more than let's say renewables. Yeah. So uh, is there a political dimension to the choice of pricing strategy? And the second thing I ask, want to ask is why should policymakers care about lost opportunity cost? Uh, wouldn't that be solved by uh, evolution over time of the plant mix? Yeah, thanks. Um... <clears throat> So these are very good questions. So let to, to answer on the political side of it. Um, so I guess there would be some question about, you know, distributional effect of this pricing scheme, like how they would impact heterogeneously different types of, of uh, suppliers or consumers. I have not really tried to develop anything on that. So I don't have a clear answer on that. What I'm sure is that some of the political debate, at least in Europe, uh, it has been a bit more connected with what I've quickly said over here, right? Um, so maybe just to spend one minute on that. So uh, so in Europe, you have this different institutional arrangement where you have the nominated electricity market operator that operates the market. So these are uh, private companies and private for-profit companies that operate the market. And to my knowledge, this different institutional arrangement has created some uh, a, a different ability of this agent to socialize type of uh, discriminatory payments, right? So in the U.S., what happens is that, for example, if you minimize the lost opportunity cost, but you want to pay the revenue shortfall, you still you will have non-zero revenue shortfall. So you need to pay these side payments, and who pays that? The independent system operator. The poor exchange here, what the principle that they started with was, they don't want to have any side payments to make because they care about their own revenue adequacy, and they're afraid that if they have to make these side payments, they need to be able to finance it, and they're not sure exactly how they would do that. So that has been clearly a political discussion, I think, of like given this institu institutional arrangement, this agent have not necessarily have a preference for some pricing rule over other over over others because they don't want to end up in a case where they have to pay these side payments and they don't have the ability to pay it, right? Um, so that that is where I view there is at least one clearly political discussion uh, around. And uh, your second question was. Well, um, another political dimension seems to me the mix of power that will end up on the grid. Uh, if you're trying to minimize um, lost opportunity cost, um, isn't that going to result in a higher mix of non-renewables on the grid? Okay, I, I think so. So I don't. I've not really worked on that issue particularly. However, I, I think I would not view that as being the main problem. Well, let's. I mean, I think for the investment problem, if you look just at the capital cost of these assets. I think there are many other dimensions that play a big role and eventually much more important than these non-convexities in the auction, right? So I'm not sure that this would be, so I do like these non-convexities and this issue, but I don't think that this is the main driver, for example, of investment. Uh, there's been a bit of research on that. So in some cases, if the difference in terms of price is significant, I guess it might have an impact, but I would not necessarily view that as the main driver uh, for, for the choice of the mix. Well, I, mean, I don't I mean so much wrong. as an investment, but it's actually on the grid. So if the if the system operator calls for power that minimizes a lost opportunity cost, yeah. that's going to affect whose power is called for, right? Yes. So that's going to affect the mix of renewables and non-renewables in a given day part. Yes. 
Okay, so that's a political effect. So that's really what I was asking. There are political consequences of these pricing rules. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hi. Oh. Yeah. You want to jump in on this? Yeah. Just uh, uh, the uh, Nicholas already said about the uh, supporting the solution that people have, and and it's uh, they, they don't have an incentive to do something different than what's the uh, welfare maximizing solution. And we had uh, real experience with this in the United States in the early days of PJM, where we set up a pricing mechanism that did not support the solution. And what happened was the participants in the market figured this out extremely rapidly, like <laughs> in the same day, uh, matter of fact, uh, over a few hours. And uh, they started scheduling themselves because they could do side deals and um, be better off personally, uh, be but they would deviate from the constraints to the solution that we actually had. And it collapsed in the literal sense of they suspended the market. Um, they went to FERC and said, we can't do this. It just isn't possible. Um, and FERC's response was, do whatever you have to do. Uh, and what they did then was switch to um, a mechanism much more like what uh, Nicholas is talking about here. So we have data on this. It was dramatic. <laughs> Maybe I'll also follow up on this question that ha uh, that she brought up because I had the same one. Um, uh -huh. And the paper you're referring to is looking at this in the short run. So what happens when you have a lot more renewables or distributed resources and these big non-convex units are less dominant in the system? Well, it really depends if you're thinking about that in the short run or the long run, right? Yes. And in the short run, that phenomenon is true. But what I found, in, at least in the long run, was that it isn't and that it is something that, you know, the impact of that on society does get lower when you have- When you increment yeah, renewable in, capacity. Yeah, in like see, a yeah. long run scenario. But you still have these questions of maybe you have a lot of these distributed resources or perhaps even price responsive demand that wants to bid in with, that would be modeled by integer variables. So I think still- I see, more, okay. more research could certainly be done there. Um, Thanks. So the, the question I wanted to bring up was, uh, right now we're looking at this in a deterministic setting, right? And in reality, we have a stochastic setting. We have uncertainty both on the supply side with more and more uncertain uh, renewables. We have uncertainty of demand as well as we have more flexible demand. And at the same time, we also have virtual bidders, right? We have multi-settlement periods. So when, when you think about incorporating both of those things, these kind of side payments that we're having, you know, they're not necessarily always due to the non-convexity. Sometimes they could be due to the uncertainties. And that's not, you know, something that this maybe tells the full story of. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on incorporating the uncertainty and the virtual bidders. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, and so you're uncertain because, so I would typically, and so... So I've never really thought about that, but I, I would view uncertainty as something that might smooth on a little bit your indivisibility, right? So that's the way I would tend to think about that. Because if you are if you have like many different possibilities that can happen and okay, you have some indivisibilities, but then if you uh, make a convex combination of that, that becomes less indivisible. Um, I think one way to think about it is that it might reduce the volatility in a way that isn't optimal for signaling the kind yeah. of flexibility on the system that you'd want to have. Yeah. The, the other point that you have mentioned, so the one on virtual bidding, uh, I think the question, so, you know, the, the starting point of the research here is just to say, we have auctions with this indivisibility, so we need to do something about it. A possible question could be, do we need it in the auction, yes or no? Like, could we simply have bids that are simpler? Uh, because you want bids simply to, uh, you know, you have some virtual bidders, you have a lot of different things. So maybe you don't want to have your bids that are as detailed as that. Uh, and that your bid may simply express, you know, the average of multiple possible schedules that depends on some uncertainty or these kind of things. Uh, I think the debates here, uh, I don't have a clear idea on that. I think the debate is a little bit different. In Europe, for example, if they stay with a zonal model, right, as you know it, so that, that's, for example, France is one single bidding area. In that case, you have some ways for uh, suppliers to make a, a bid that reflects the combination of entire portfolio, right? If you have geographically something that is much more detailed, where on each node you have like one single power plant, then it becomes a bit more difficult to just ignore completely the indivisibilities and have more simpler bids. 
so to me, that was an idea. I was wondering whether, uh, uh, you, you know, in the first place, you could ask whether do we need this non-convexity, yes or no, uh, related to this. I mean, if you view that as a financial market with some free bids and so on, it's not necessarily that you want to include all of that. But I think the picture is a bit different when you have something that is more detailed, when in each bidding area, you have essentially one supplier and that you then want to account a bit more precisely to what is this cost structure. Um, that would be some of my thoughts on that, but I don't, I've not really worked on that much more than this year. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much. Interesting <clears throat> discussion. Uh, so I um, wanted to ask about the, in the European context, I think you said, Daniel just touched upon this actually, that the generators offer portfolios instead of individual at the individual unit level. Is that yes. right? Yeah. So that's different from the US uh, approach. So could you say a little bit more about how that affects the importance of the non-convexities and also whether you consider that in your analysis? Yes, uh, good, very good question. So uh, indeed in Europe, so we have, it also includes multi-part non-convex bids, but the bidding format is, is completely different. So in the US, the bidding format is pretty much a very physical model where you just submit RAM constraints, minimum uptime, downtime, and these kind of things. In Europe, it's more a portfolio approach where the bidding products are a bit more standardized or uh, so what you submit in, type, in terms of bid is, for example, blocks. So you say, I produce something which is indivisible that spans over multiple time periods, and that is a block. And then you may also submit link blocks. You say, well, if you accept this block of power, then you may also access this other one, which is maybe cheaper, and these kind of things. Right? You have exclusive blocks where you say, OK, there are three possible schedules, and then you can accept one of the three, but just one of them. So they are relying more on this type of products, which a bit more distant from really the physics of the system. But in the end, they also have these non-convexities and so on. So that was the, they are facing the problem. Now, maybe to set something more on that, and because I have some backups, backup slide also on this, uh, just to present in one slide, the way they are doing that in Europe concretely, uh, right? So this is 30 pages of description summarized in one slide. Uh, so the pricing rule in Europe is the following. So that this is the example of the first slide, right? So what they say is you have, for example, here a block. So that would be a typical product that you see in the European market. The way they treat that in Europe, and that is linked to the ability to socialize uh, site payments. What they say is, OK, but if we do that, if we pick 20, 30, whatever price, we will need to provide site payments to, to someone, either to C or to B, but to someone we need to provide site payments. So what the open electricity market does is this. Just reject the block number C, and you click D. And if you take this price of 90 euros, no need of side payments. And with this price, everyone would implement that. Uh, but it has a drawback that I've mentioned, right? So you create inefficiency, like uh, in this case, you reduce the surplus significantly, and then it's uh, you still have some people that have incentives to schedule differently, and, and so on. Um, so that's a bit the way non-convexities are present in the market and how they are treated by the European auction. And then I think your last question was about uh, if I include that in the data set, and the answer is unfortunately no. So the two data sets that I have are not uh, data sets of the European market itself because I don't have, we simply don't have access to the data. Yeah. Uh, so it would, I mean, it would definitely be worth doing some analysis with the real auction data set. Uh, I guess power exchange might do that, uh, but yes, uh, I did not have access to this data. Yeah. Hi, thank you Hi. so much for the presentation. I'm still learning a lot about energy markets, but I was previously working in California as a renewable energy advocate. Uh -huh. And something that I heard a lot was this non-convexities is the reason why California should join like a Western RTO. But it was really interesting to see that this problem still exists at like FERC level data nationally in the United States. I was wondering if you can speak to that a little bit more about, you know, does expanding kind of uh, reducing the barriers um, for energy transmission across larger regions, does that help this problem? Mm. Okay, uh, th thanks uh, for the question. So let me maybe take that slide. So what you're saying is to what extent 
where is it over here to what extent connecting these areas together may have an impact on the issue that you are tackling right uh so honestly i'm a bit unsure so um my first thought about that would be, you know, we, we saw one result, which was if you extend the size of the market, you expand things to smoothen out a little bit. <clears throat> the thing is that mathematically, so what, what I've done here is that I expand the size of the market, but I did not expect expand the dimension of my pricing problem. So I did not add new locations. I simply duplicated power plants. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly what would be the effects because, you know, if, if you expand the geographical area, but that because of congestion, some of the areas are still kind of isolated. I'm not sure about what would be the effect overall on that issue. Uh, but that is a, a good question. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Thanks. A question for future research. A question for future research, yes. indeed. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before we wrap up, let me note that we will meet again at noon this coming Monday. Back here in Rubenstein 414, we'll host Jonas Meckling, who's a faculty member at UC Berkeley and currently visiting at HBS as an HBS Climate Fellow. And finally, please join me in thanking Nicholas Stevens for his presentation today. Thank you, Nicholas.